I hope everyone had a nice weekend. Please uh, pick up your, your card. Uh, our bird for the, today is the grackle. A not uh, a particularly nice sounding name, but it, it is a, a nice looking bird like uh, crows. They also uh, travel in, in, in flocks. And like uh, many birds, they take bird baths to clean themselves off and uh, dry out and are nice and, and fluffy afterward. And one of the notable things about the grackle is that they're very noisy. They, they like to, to kick up a racket. This one really uh, putting some, some oomph into it, perhaps trying to uh, get the attention of a, a female grackle. But I thought it would be worth hearing. They're sort of like uh, uh, somewhere between like a buzzsaw and a, a screw factory sound when they are in a flock. Really, uh, truly a noisy, noisy bird. All right, so a uh, couple things that I wanted to mention to start out. Uh, the first is, as you may have seen, uh, the college is adjusting the, the mask guidance um, starting Wednesday. So uh, for this class, masks will be optional. You are, of course, welcome to, to wear a mask if, if you would like. I will not be wearing a mask. Um, and uh, if, you, if you have concerns, please uh, uh, let me know. Um, for the quiz, there is a find minimum function that uh, you are supposed to implement. Uh, there is a built-in Python function, min, which takes in a sequence and returns the minimum element. Uh, you should not use min in the find minimum function. I'm asking you to actually implement the finding of the minimum, not just use the Python uh, function to do it for you. So if you've already submitted a find minimum with min, correct that and resubmit. Um, before the, the deadline uh, tonight. Um, and last, for the lab uh, due Wednesday, uh, I wanted to just point out uh, one of the, the neat things about, let me make the font bigger. There we go. All right. One of the neat things about all these constants is that your code should use these variables, uh, which means that uh, when I run the game, normally I have kind of the ball and paddle and five rows of, of bricks that I would expect, uh, but I can start changing these and say, let's have eight rows, let's have 12 columns, uh, and I run that the rows and, and columns are using those variables and so the, the grid that it's created has changed. Uh, can also say the brick to ball ratio, normally the uh, brick is one and a half times as wide as the ball, but I can say, no, I would like the ball to be three times the size of, of the brick. And I have a giant, giant ball the collisions of the giant ball with the tiny paddle, of course, don't, don't work that well. So maybe also make the paddle bigger. And now there's giant ball that can still only break one brick, sadly. And you can, of course, make it even more ridiculous. And the game becomes uh, not particularly challenging. Uh, but the idea is that by uh, using uh, these constants, these variables in your code, you can then change them and just kind of change how the game uh, the game works without ever having to go into the uh, the code of the game. Uh, any questions on uh, on the, these constants or or uh, uh, the lab or or the quiz? Anything that we've been we've been working on?
right. Let's get to it. So we're going to do some, some practice with uh, loops and lists to, to start out. Here we have uh, uh, a list, nums, and a loop that uses our, our range function. And inside the loop, we're doing something with this, this nums list using that indexing that we talked about last time. So take a minute and uh, try and work through what will be printed at the end of this code. All right, mostly thinking D, but maybe one of these others. Please discuss with your neighbors how you thought about what this loop is going to do. All right, we have uh, mostly uh, reach consensus on uh, what what this code uh, will will print um, in this for loop. Uh, what values is I going to have as we go through the loop? Gary. I need the values of the list. Yeah, it will, it will go through the, the values of the, the indexes and our list nums, and, and what values will those be? So are you saying I will be 4, 5, and 6? Um, well, the index is... It, the, it's using the index, like the range for the index for the list numbers, and then it's getting the value from that. So the values that end up like used to there are four, five, and six, but I think I would still be zero. But I was a little confused about that. Yes, that's that's exactly exactly right. That our our range there says start at zero. And then we have this len of nums thing. Uh, who can remind us what this len function does? Okay. It's literally just the length of the index we put in. Or not maybe less the index, but like how many numbers are in the sequence. Yes, it is the length of the sequence that we pass as input to, to this function. So. What is len of nums going to return for this particular list? Yeah, this will this will return three because there are three things in our sequence, uh, and then we also say one. What is this third parameter to range? Yes, yeah, the step. So we're going to count by ones. So start at zero, counting by ones, go up to but not include three. So I will be 0, 1, and 2. As Gabby was saying, when I is 0, 1, and 2, and we do nums bracket I, we're getting the element at the index of I. And if we remember the, the picture of lists is having these numbered slots inside of them from last time, our nums uh, list we know has four, five, six inside of it, uh, and we number the slots starting at zero, zero, one, two. So that means nums of i, nums at slot zero, or nums at slot five, or nums at slot one is five, nums at slot two at index two is six. And what's our star star two? Yeah, it's it's the exponent of two. So we're doing each of these multiplying by itself. Uh, so four times four, and then the left hand side of the equals, when we have an index, that means that's where we are storing the value on the right side. So inside it says nums i or or nums at zero. They were putting the current value there squared back in there. So we replace 4 with 16, we replace 5 with 25, we replace 6 with 36. Any questions on, on this example? All right, 
let's mark that as done. There we go. So we have a list digits. The elements in this list are uh, our text uh, strings in between double quotes. Those can be things in a list. And so what will this code print? Take uh, a minute to think about it and then we'll see what our collective thinking is. All right, we're, we're pretty sure there's going to be an index error. Uh, that's indeed uh, correct. Can someone explain why? Like, what does it mean? Why is there no index 5? Yeah. Uh, the indices for lists start at 0. So if there's 0, 1, 3, 3, 4, there's still 5 values. There's actually 0 to 4. Yeah, this is our, our list indexes start at 0. So we would not, we would have, need six things in a list to have an index 5. Questions on this? All right, I think I have one more for us. Start out. Here, another, another list of numbers, another loop, another range. What is, what is this going to do? Ah, excellent. Probably a B, C, or D. Uh, I mean, safely rule on A. Please discuss with your, with your neighbors what you think this code will do. All right, if you have changed your mind, now is the time to uh, hold up your new thinking. All right, we are moving towards zero, 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 but uh, not consensus yet. So let's walk through a couple iterations of our, of our loop. Uh, first time we go into the loop, what is I going to be? Yeah, our, our range says start at one, so I is going to be one. Uh, what's nums at index i? Also, also one. How about nums index i minus one? Zero. And what is our line three? In this situation, does it matter what is in nums at index i? No, because we're just, this line says whatever's on the right hand side of the equals, nums i minus one, we're assigning that to the spot in the list at index i, replacing whatever's there. So we say goodbye one, you are now zero. Then we're at the bottom of our loop. There's something left in our sequence. What is i, the second iteration? It's two. We know that we don't care about what nums i is because we're just going to replace it. And what is nums i minus one when i is two? Yeah, because we can look. We changed what was it that index the last time, the first time through our loop. So now when we go i is two, we go to index one. Oh, it's we've we put zero there, and now we're putting zero instead of the thing that is at index two because we're putting something at the spot nums index i and i is two this time through the loop, and this will just continue where each time we replace. We replace the thing at, at index i with at i minus 1, but we'll have just put 0 at that previous spot as we go through the loop. All right, this is a, a tricky example. Ask me, ask me some questions. What would be helpful for me to go over? Yes? I'm still confused what nums i So inside the loop, we have this line 
nums n index i equals nums n index i minus 1. And what this brackets i means, so at one level it means the element at index, whatever the value of i is. So whether i is 1 or 2 or 0 or 5, it says this means the element at that index, at that spot in the list. But the tricky thing is it means slight, it uses that in a different way depending on which side of the equals it is on. Because as we've usually seen, uh, like when we have something like x equals 7, we've seen that the thing on the right side is a value, and the thing on the left side has typically been a label. Like this is what we're going to call the value on the right side. So in this case, the value on our right side, or, or the thing on the right side of the equals, it's still a value. It's still just like get whatever value is at the index. We, we do i minus 1. That gives us a number, and that tells us the spot in the list to look at. So in our first iteration, i was 1. Subtract 1 to get 0, and that brings us to, to 0. The thing on the left still is a label, or we might think of this as a location in our computer's memory where we're going to send this value. And so nums brackets i on this side says we have this list nums, we have a spot, an index inside of it, this is the location where we're going to put this value. And so this will take the value, which in this case was 0, and store it in the spot in the list which matches index i. So we took the thing at index 0, which was 0, and we put it at the spot that was index i, index 1, and we placed whatever was there with this new value. So this is a, a, a subtle thing about list indexing, is that when we index a list on the right-hand side of one of these assignments, we mean the value at that index. When we index a list on the left-hand side of assignment, we mean the location in the list. We mean that's where we want to put whatever that value is. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right, sir. Um, so... In range, the second parameter is the stop, right? Mm -hmm. And in length, it's not counting by index, it's counting by like object in the list, right? Um, so, uh, you're saying what is, what is range doing? Oh, no. I meant, so, what is length counting by index? Like the length of numbers? Um, so, our, our, Function len, uh, it turns a sequence, in this case our list, into an int, into a, a number, where that is the like the number of things, the number of slots in our list. So our len of, of nums. would return a number, what, what number would it return in this case? Um, five. Exactly. So it would give us back the number five, and then this is like range starting at one, going up to, but not including five. But then um, in the final solution, why did it print out five options instead of stopping, not including the fifth? So, Inside the inside the loop, um, we have i one, two, three, and four. So, like you're saying, we don't we stop before we get to five, and so we do four of these nums i equals nums i minus one, and so that will will change the thing in index one, index two, index three, and index four, because i is 
one, two, three, four. And then outside of the loop, after all done, it just says print nums, which is print the whole thing, whatever the var variable nums labels in, in memory. So that just prints out the whole list. And if regardless of what happened before, when we get to print nums, that's going to print out all of all of nums. Is that what you were asking? Yeah. Yeah, Rebecca. So why um, is index two zero? Why is the thing at index two zero? Because when we the the first iteration through the list, we uh, put zero at index one. Then the second time through the list, that change, it's still 0 at index 1. And so the second time through the list, when i is 2, that gives us nums at index 2 equals nums at index i minus 1, which will be 1. And so we look at the thing at index 1, that's 0, and then that's what we put at index 2. Is that what you were asking? Yeah, this the because each time we go through this loop, we're actually changing the list. And so that will affect the next time we go through the loop. It uses the, the change list. Other questions? Uh, this might be a good uh, bit of code to put into Python Tutor and uh, use that to step through it uh, line by line if um, uh, you're looking for a little more uh, explanation. Let's do a bit of code writing practice. I would like for you to implement a function called count evens. It should return the number of even numbers in this list numbers. So for example, this count evens of one seven four six three ten. Should return three because there are three even numbers in the list. And does anyone uh, remember how we check if uh, a good way to check if a number is even? Yeah, Gabby. Um, if Exactly. That if we check the remainder two and it equals zero, then the number is even because two went in uh, with nothing uh, could divide x with nothing left over. So this function probably needs to use uh, both a loop and an if statement. Uh, so by yourself or, or with your neighbors, uh, work on uh, writing the code for this function. So one, one way to think about a function like this is that we use a variable to keep track of the result. We want to uh, 
we want to achieve, in this case, a, a count. And then inside a loop, we, when appropriate, update or modify that variable. Uh, inside a loop, maybe count up every time we find an even number, and then at the end we would return count. So go ahead and, and discuss your uh, current approach with, with your neighbor and, and maybe brainstorm how to, to fill in this, this middle part of looping over numbers and adding one to a count uh, if it's even. All right. Want to uh, make sure that we have time for everything we need to do today. So, as I mentioned uh, on the board, I like to approach solving these sort of problems by having uh, what I call an accumulator variable. Some variable that as I go through my code is going to keep like building up the answer that I want at the end. So here my count is going to start at zero, and then I'm going to slowly like build it up to the to the final result that I want, then the the number of, of even numbers in this list. So I need to check each number in the list, whether it's it's even or not odd. And I don't know ahead of time how many numbers I need to check. Like if I knew there were only going to be two numbers in the list, I could check the first number and the second number, and I would know that would be all, all there was. But I don't know ahead of time how many numbers there are. And so that's a great time to use a for loop, because if I use my list numbers as a sequence, then my for loop will go through each thing in that list, no matter how many or how few there are. And then inside this loop, x is going to be the current element in the list that, I am, uh, uh, that I, I'm checking. So then I would use my check for whether it's even. And when it is even, I'm going to say, oh, I found another even number. So my count is going to go up by one because it's keeping track of how many even numbers I've seen so far. And then importantly, outside the loop, after the loop, so unindented all the way to where the loop is because I only want to return once I've gone through the entire loop, once I've checked every number in my list. At that point, I will have checked every number in my list. I will have counted all the ones that are even, and I can return that as the result. And I can run this, have all these little test cases where I've noted, okay, how many even numbers should it print out? Three, two, zero, zero, one. Looks like this, this works. What are your questions on this? Yes. It was a little different, but for the example you posted, um, with the sum total, I was just confused about what that little line was. Was it sum total plus equals sum total? Yes, yeah, so uh, computer scientists uh, hate pressing extra keys on the keyboard when they don't have to. So they decided count equals count plus one. That is way too much work. I can write something that does exactly the same thing with this plus equals, which just says take the current value and add one to it, put it back and count. So count plus equals one and count equals count plus one are exactly the same. Python just does the computer scientist thing of letting you use fewer, fewer characters. Other questions? Yeah, Marco. Dominic, would you be able to help him out? It may be that the, the terminal is in the like Python interpreter and just needs to be reset. Uh, other questions? All 
All right. So something that you are tasked with doing in the lab is creating that grid of bricks where each row is a different color and we have a number of columns and a number of rows. And uh, as a look at how we might approach this, here is a somewhat simpler task than making graphical rectangles, uh, is I want to make this grid of different text symbols where each row is made up of a particular symbol and we have four symbols, hash, star, at, ampersand, and then it starts repeating as we do more rows, hash, star, uh, and, and so on. So I'm going to keep this on the right here and make a grid.py. And so this would be uh, a situation where I, I would like you to focus on reading the code that I'm writing uh, and, and not on um, uh, copying down uh, everything. All the code that I'm about to write is in the notes uh, for today. So in the lab, we have a number of rows and a number of columns. and in this grid, I know that I have six rows and eight, eight columns that I want to, want to display. And I might start out by saying, all right, let me try and make kind of one row's worth of, uh, of characters. So for this, I want what I would call, what I would call a counting loop a loop where I don't care about what the sequence is, I just want the loop to go around a certain number of times. So when I say for i in range of n calls, because range of n calls is going to give me a sequence from zero up to the value n calls, so zero through seven in this case, since n calls is eight. And so this is a loop that will go around eight times. And I'm not even going to use this variable i. I'm just going to print a hash and tell it to put a space at the end. All right, so I have one row of my grid. Uh, and so as I mentioned on Friday, to turn this from one row of the grid to rows and columns, I want one loop inside another. So I have the code that makes one row. And so if I write a loop that goes around some number of times uh, that I want rows, and then put my loop that makes one row inside of it, now I have, I'm making one row uh, uh, inside of a loop that goes around a number of times that, uh, that is the number of rows I want, uh, except the, the output is just one, one long, huge row. So there's something that I'm, uh, that I'm, I'm missing here. Uh, suggestions on, on what that might be. Yeah, so I'm not. Yeah, there's some I need to like tell it to go to the next line after I'm finished with with a single row. So where in here am I finished with us individual row? Cool. After the for i loop? Yeah, exactly. The, this loop over n calls that I started with is what makes a single row. And so after it is kind of the time between making run one row and going around my uh, for j in, in range of n rows loop that does, does the rows. So this is where I could add a print with no 
uh, parameter, which just prints out a blank line. And so this will, will move it to the next line. And I've got a grid of uh, my symbols here. So if, I, if I'm looking at this, this picture uh, over here on the right, what aren't I doing? Yeah, all the rows are the same, are the same symbol. So like in the lab, we have an array colors, or uh, sorry, a list colors that, that has the different colors in it. I'm going to make a symbols list that has the four symbols that I want to display and then instead of printing a hash every time I'm going to for each row set before I go into the loop that makes the row set the symbol I'm going to use for that row so I have this list symbols and I want to be choosing one of those symbols for each row. And this is where this loop over rows, we're actually going to make use of the fact that the uh, uh, variable j starts at zero and counts up by one, which I can use as a list index because our lists start at index zero and they count up by ones. So I could just say symbols uh, at index J. And so each row, I'm gonna kind of get the symbol that corresponds with, with the, the row that I'm on. If I run this, I see that I get the first four rows, uh, go through the four symbols, and then I get a list index error because J has gone to four, there is no index four in my, in my list of symbols. So here is a little trick that I can, I can use. Because I, I want my symbols to kind of wrap back around, the remainder operator, the percent, can act as a kind of wrap back around trick, where I want J to go 0, 1, 2, 3, and then when it's 4, it should actually go back to 0. When it's 5, it should go back to 1. When it's 6, it should go back to 2. And so if I say remainder length of symbols, this length of symbols will be 4, and so this index will just kind of wrap back around to 0 any time it would go past 3. And now I get my nice little grid where it alternates, um, where it goes through this, the, the symbols. I can then change, give me 10 rows with 20 columns. And it just prints out the same thing and keeps going through these, these four different symbols. All right, ask me questions about this, this uh, nested loops example. Yes? Could, uh, could you just put the, like instead of assigning the symbol variable, could you just put that uh, like list caller index right into the print function? Yeah, so the question is, do I need this, this symbol variable? Uh, Jonathan's right that I could just print out um, uh, that expression directly. I'm assigning it to a variable because um, uh, I find that makes it easier for me for me to read the code. But this would this would work just just as well. Other questions. All right, so the wrinkle that you will need to figure out for the lab is when you make the brick, not only do you have to give it a color, you have to give it an X and a Y position. And so you'll be wanting to use 
the loop variables as they count from zero up to the number of rows or up to the number of columns to keep track of how many, say, brick widths you need to move over in the x direction to put the next brick or how many brick heights you need to move down to put the next row of bricks and also keep in mind the brick sep variable which is the amount of space there should be between each uh, brick both vertically and horizontally and cool uh, while we're talking about this when you're making uh, you're adding your brick to the canvas after every loop um, to for it to know like distinguish between bricks and not just override each brick with a new brick object is the best way to do that make a list of bricks that's that's a, a, a good question. Um, so you could, uh, you could though it's a more complicated approach would be to build up a list of bricks and then do a loop and add them all afterward, or immediately after you create the brick inside the loop you add it to the the graphics window, and that will, will make the brick show up. And then even if you change, even if you, in another iteration, assign the same variable to a different brick, we've already added that brick to the window and it will, it will stay there. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah. Like the, the general idea here is to loop over rows, set color, loop over the columns, create brick, and right after you create the brick, add that brick to the window. And then you won't have to bother with making a list of bricks or adding them later or anything like that. Yeah, I thought, sort of, I thought we did. You know, it keeps on ignoring all the other bricks and it thinks the last brick is the only brick. Hmm. Um, yeah, that's, uh, there may, the, I would look for, is everything indented kind of inside the, the loop that you, you wanted? It. Other questions? So something else that we can do, um, or there are many things that we can do with lists. Uh, linked from the notes for today, practice with loops. There is this section on list methods, which are like those history things that we used in, in lab one. Uh, but it links to the Python documentation on all the different sort of functions we can apply to particular lists. So, one in particular is if we set x to be an empty list, and then we use the append method, that will add whatever I give it as a new thing on the end of the list. So then if I print x, this will print out a list with, with three in it. And so by using append, I can, can add new things to, to an existing list. And as you can see on the, on the screen, uh, there are ways to uh, insert uh, insert a thing in the list at a specific position rather than appending it to the end. There's a way to remove things. There's a way to remove all things from a list. Uh, there's a way to ask a list what index a particular thing is at. Like if, uh, if I, I want to know where in a list a particular number is, you can use this index. But just focusing uh, on append for now, uh, these other methods uh, will, um, 
we'll, we'll talk more about them as, as we need them. And, and uh, Google and the Python documentation are, are your friend for, for figuring out how to do a specific thing with a list. Uh, but let's use our last few minutes to do a bit of practice uh, with appending to a list. So I have a list nums and then a for loop where I'm appending uh, a new thing to the end of the list. All right. Discuss with your neighbor why you think it will have a specific outcome. I will uh, reveal that this will uh, produce uh, a list um, one, one, two, three, five, uh, because each time negative one is the last element, negative two is the second to last element, so one plus one is two, we'll add that on, then the last and second to last become one and two, add those as three, and the final time through list when i is four, we'll add two and three together and get five. All right, so that'll do it for today. Uh, I have office hours tomorrow night in the lab, uh, quiz due tonight, and I will see you on Wednesday.